Yeah, there we we're are. Live. Hey, Woo! we're live. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Chris. And I'm Beth. And Haunts of Richmond. Uh, appreciate y'all coming in and uh, tuning in with us for yet another week of quarantine. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Hope you all are still healthy. Notice we're bad matching Guinness glasses yes. tonight. I just have the bait because I have the brandy. Yeah, she's drinking brandy, and I'm I'm not drinking Guinness. I'm actually drinking uh, Rich Brow, yes. our local Rich Brow, our friends down at Rich Brow. Thirteen o'clock. Thirteen o'clock. Delicious as always. Yes. Uh, peanut butter chocolate pie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, peanut butter chocolate pie stout. It's quite tasty, but definitely, yeah, definitely go pick some up. They are yes. open. Yes, they are open, uh, except for Tuesday. Yes. So they won't be open tomorrow, but uh, yeah, they're they're I think always, they open every day three. Uh, they they got some it's odd on, hours because yeah. of quarantine. So but you check can their check Facebook page. They'll post when, what they're open and what they've got available, and um, they actually are working on with some of the sales right now. Yep. Is it uh, is going to benefit the uh, Richmond Restaurant Workers Relief really Fund? So yep. definitely, if you can give give purchase yeah. a beer. They actually did a pretty nice live stream uh, like a long we. Uh, uh, afternoon long concert on yeah. Saturday. They did theirs on Facebook Live too and it was all uh, that fundraiser for the Richmond Restaurant Workers Relief Fund and uh, just because if you missed the uh, the concert live you can mm -hmm. still tune or not well I think you can watch the recording of it but yes. also uh, they do have links on their Facebook page so if you look up Rich Brow Brewing Company there are links uh, in their news feed and it'll take you to a uh, well, you know, a link to go and uh, donate to the Richmond Restaurant Workers the Relief Fund. So, yes. because, yeah, Richmond retro Restaurant Workers... Uh, include me. Yeah, well, <laughs> include her, but they've had a, you know, it's been a rough go for them. Been a rough go for a lot of people over the last few weeks. And hopefully soon we will be in phase one and two and we can open back up again. Yep, yeah, yeah, we're, we're kind of hoping that um, a couple weeks from now we might be able to start offering some tours again, but... In the Until the then, stay safe, stay at home. Yes. Listen to us on Mondays. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because we're we're not planning on stopping this anytime no. soon. And I have lots of creepy dolls to drive about again yes. tonight because I've been talking about them. But what, that is coming up soon. <laughs> that'll be another episode because yes. tonight we got our haunted palaces. Yes. So we're gonna actually head over to Merry Old England yes. uh, and check out a couple of palaces there, and then hop over to Hawaii which is the only place in the United States where we had a royal residence uh, before Hawaii got annexed by the United States and not in a great way. We'll get yeah. to that. Yeah. Now, obviously, I don't know if anybody tracked uh, you know, our, our posts through the week and whatnot, but just a couple days ago we decided that we're going to do this Haunted Palaces two weeks in a row because we 34 just, pages. We got way too pages. much material. We got, we got <laughs> like probably at least a few hours worth of talking time. And the research was all done and all lined up, and which and that was after cutting three palaces, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> and it's uh, so it's already all written and good to go for next Monday. So uh, we have that all lined up, and uh, we're we're just going to start tonight. We yep. got two locations: England and Hawaii, because why not? Yep. Uh, so we're going to start with the Tower of London, because that is the most famous castle palace in all of England. It was built in 1078 by the William the Conqueror. Uh, it was a royal residence for many, many years. Um, it was a, also defi uh, designed to withstand battle, and it was uh, under siege several times. It was expanded uh, within the original confines, the original design, back in the 12th and 13th century. It has been the royal mint. It has, of course, the place where the crown jewels are held. It is a uh, royal treasury at one point in time. Uh, it was a public records office, an armory, and the royal mint's home. It was also a prison. Which is what most people know it for, yes. honestly. I mean, <laughs> because dear old Henry VIII and his successors all imprisoned a lot of people there and they got their heads chopped off. They didn't all get their heads chopped off inside the palace. That's a very distinct uh, notion. There's actually only seven people that lost their heads inside the palace. Uh, most of the beheadings that happened, uh, or the executions that happened over 400 years of executions, happened actually outside at a notorious... Am I remember oh. this correctly? Yep, Notorious Hell. Ah, I did remember yes. it correctly. <laughs> which is, which I mean, it's all so funny because the thing that people remember the Tower, or think of first when they hear the Tower of London is this dramatic torture prison where all these executions took place and stuff and like that. And uh, they didn't. Hey, I've been there. There's not space for executions. Well, there is space for executions, but there's not space for public executions, and that's the key thing. Executions were a public affair. Everybody came to see them. Everybody came and picnicked and brought their children to see these things. 
Uh, it was a form of entertainment. And you couldn't pack everybody who lived in London who wanted to come and see one of these executions inside the Tower of London. So you, that's why they did most of the, the executions outside at Notorious Hill. But the more famous ones like Anne Boleyn, uh, she was, uh, of course, executed within the uh, tower along with several other people that we're actually going to talk about. So those were more private executions than public, but only a select few people there to witness it. Um, it was also uh, a prison during the World Wars. Not a lot of people remember that or realize that. Both World Wars, it was also a prison. It held a lot of uh, prisoners who were uh, involved in the espionage game. Uh, I'm actually reading about World War II's espionage game right now in Britain, so it's kind of fun that we're talking about this at the same time. Uh, but 12 people were actually executed for that game during the World Wars. Uh, so those were the most recent executions that happened uh, within the, around the confines of the, the Tower of London. They were executed for espionage. For espionage, for spying. You said that they were executed for that game. Well, the es espionage game. The espionage game, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't the Hunger Games. No. We're not talking about that. Not yet, anyway. No. <laughs> no. But yeah, so it's still, uh, now today it's taken care of by the historic Royal Palace. It's a charity and it's protected as a World Heritage Site. And it survived quite a bit. Most notably, it was badly damaged, actually, during World War II, during the Blitz. So, so, and restored. So. And restored. So they, uh, they've they held on to that part of their heritage very tightly. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, as I mentioned, very well-renowned for this, you know, this prison and torture type thing, which was only a very small portion of its history, but... The most it, notorious portion. Yes, but it has, a, you know, a very, very long history. I mean, going back at this point, like, you know, what, 950 years, mm -hmm. something like that, roughly? I mean, it yeah. goes, goes back quite a ways at this point. And um, it just, you know, stands to reason that you know, more people passing through a place, the more, go more ghost stories you're going to kind of have to it. Oh, yeah. So, and, and the Tower of London has no shortage of ghost stories. There are so many various hauntings that have happened here over the years. Some of them famous, some of them they might not, not know so too much famous. about. So we have 11 stories that we're going to share about the ghosts of the Tower. And when you go and you talk to the yeomen, um, they're actually pretty open about the ghosts. In fact, a lot of the yeomen will give ghost stories uh, during regular tours, or they'll do a, a, a tour that is just the ghost of the tower. So it's kind of cool to see um, who you can talk to and who's the most knowledgeable about this. So some of the stories are from the Omen, some of them have been recorded throughout time. Uh, so we're going to work our way through from modern ones to ancient ones to the very first one that was recorded as being there. So we're just going to take turns. <laughs> There's a lot of stories here. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that I do really appreciate about the Tower of London in general, is that it is a very historic site, but that they don't. They they don't deny their. No, haunted. they they embrace it. They embrace it. It's it's kind of disappointing, you know, from the the haunted history aspect that we approach so many things from. That when a historic site that has such fascinating history, where they say, nope, no hauntings here, don't happen. Mm -hmm. Tower but, of London doesn't fit that mold. There are some in here that will do that, but Tower of London embraces this. And heck, one of the queens, Queen Victoria, that we talked about on our haunted trains um, episode here. Uh, you know, the moth that saved her that was reflecting in the light of the lamp of the train is actually pinned to a board in the Tower of London. So, you know, they fully, fully embrace this. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the first one I'm going to let Chris take over. This, uh, this is known as the Men by the Fireplace. Yeah, so these are really going to be a kind of a set of, you know, short vignette type stories. Um, because they're, they're just, there's so many, mm -hmm. you know, small little antidotes that, that, you know, that we have for this. So the first one was actually, it was fairly recent, and uh, not, not too long ago, uh, relatively speaking, as far as Tower of London history is concerned. We're only going to go back about 30 years to the mid-1980s. And there was one young yeoman warder who was up in the Byword Tower reading the paper. Because, well, that's what you did, you didn't have your phone to play with. So you <laughs> took the paper or took a magazine with you to go ahead and pass the time during your shift if you're just kind of... You know, in that kind of job. Well, he's sitting there, and suddenly, next to the fireplace, the warder knows, uh, notices a pair of spindly, medieval-looking men smoking clay pipes. Not necessarily out of place if you were doing some sort of reenactment, but there's no reenactment going on, and those men certainly were not there before. So as he started to stare, one of the men turned around and stared back at him, and then when the moment was over, the men vanished. In Yeoman Clerk... Wilson's words. The young man wasn't sure whether he had seen the past 
or the past hit scene in the future. Kind of an interesting idea. Was it a slit in time um, that allowed you a glimpse into the past that may have allowed them a glimpse into the future? This is a, a well theorized idea uh, that's out there in the paranormal community, and it's not. This isn't the only palace where that is thought to have occurred. Yep. And just to be clear about this, basically the theory stands that there are not really ghosts per se. They're not people from the past, they're not dead people coming back to haunt us, but rather that you're actually kind of get a glimpse through some sort of time rift, and that that is this haunting that's going on. So mm -hmm. it's one of the many theories because the types of hauntings and the theories behind the various mm -hmm. hauntings are endless, but it's kind of one of the more interesting ones that um, certainly kind of, uh, it piques the curiosity of scientists. Oh yeah, and the first person who gets to prove this or disprove it it's going to be on every single talk show. All right, so we talked about one of the more recent um, recordings by one of the Yeomans. Uh, let's go back to the very first ghost that was recorded being at uh, the Tower of London, and this is uh, Sir Thomas Beckett. Uh, Thomas Beckett was uh, one of the first ghosts seen in the tower when the inner curtain wall was still in construction. Uh, the ghost was dressed in his bishop's regalia, and uh, he would take apart the arch brick by brick. He was apparently not pleased with this construction where it was located. Uh, he actually reduced the wall to rubble uh, one night by just striking it with the uh, base of his cross. Uh, the grandfather, Henry III, was said to be the reason for Thomas Beckett's death. And so um, Henry III actually, or excuse me, the grandfather built the chapel in the tower for the archbishop, and people believed that it was Becca that who was pleased with the construction of the chapel, because for a while, there were no more interruptions. Uh, unfortunately, once the curtain wall started going up, that's when the interruption started again. So at this point in time, Traders Gate is actually part of this wall, and it's uh, being construction during being constructed during the reign of Edward I. Uh, and again, the work is not going smoothly because it's connected to the inner wall. Having erected the arch, the builders returned to find it collapsed the very next day. So Edward I actually is absolutely furious. He demands it gets built anew, and again, the archway collapse. At this point in time, the locals are hearing the stories of this collapse, and they're retelling the stories of Thomas Beckett, and Edward actually hears of this. He's like, okay, if building a chapel pleased him, let's do something else to please him and maybe he'll leave the gate alone. So uh, he actually had the gate built once more and this time named it St. Thomas's Gate. Well, it stands to this day, it never collapsed again. Uh, so if you have an angry ghost who's interrupting your construction, you might want to rename something after it and maybe it'll calm down. It's a lesson from this one. <laughs> Chris is responding online, so I'll continue. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories, because this is a Shakespeare tale. Uh, those of you that know your Richard III stories, uh, of course, um, Richard is known to have murdered his nephews in order to seize the crown. He is the, known as the humpback or the humpback king. Uh, and this is known as the Princess in the Tower. Uh, this is the also nicknamed the Bloody Tower. Now, um, the story goes, the two young princes, Edward V and his brother Richard, uh, were declared illegitimate by Parliament and sent to what was then known as the Garden Tower. As I said, it's been since renamed the, the Bloody Tower. Um, they were seen playing around happily on the grounds and suddenly vanished, never to be seen again, supposedly murdered by Uncle Dickie or Richard III, the Duke of Gloucester. Uh, and this was to extinguish any hope of either royal laying claim to the throne and thus succeeding himself, um, ensuring himself the, the throne without a, um, any sort of threat to it. Uh, in 1674, the two skeletons believed to be the children were unearthed beneath the staircase in the White Tower. King Charles II ordered a royal burial, burial of the remains at Westminster Abbey. Um, being After. royal is brutal. Oh yeah, I mean, Game of Thrones, totally true. Totally true. <laughs> <laughs> Names have changed. Game's still the same. <laughs> uh, the ghosts of the children are often seen wearing nightgowns, clutching each other in terror in the rooms of the castle. They've also been uh, sighted uh, dressed in the same white nightgowns, wandering aimlessly around the tower grounds. Everybody wonders why the nightgowns. They're pretty sure the kids were murdered at night while they were in their nightgowns, so that's why they're still in them. 
Even children of preschool age who couldn't possibly know the history have reported two melancholy youths in funny clothes, as they're also heard throughout the tower laughing and sometimes screaming. Uh, they will play on the battlements, and the more contemporary visitors to the tower report hearing them laughing throughout the halls on the ground. <laughs> now, yeah. murdering your, your nephews, yep. your young nephews, mm -hmm. just to secure your place on the throne. Yep. That's, a, that's, that's your ultimate power grab. That's grim. That's really grim. I mean, they're luckily to survive at that point. You think of Mary, Queen of Scots, who inherited when she was just uh, five days old? Yeah, really yeah. young. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm surprised she survived to adulthood. Another story. Yeah. Another good, you know, very interesting history one. But, yeah. So, moving along. The next one, this one is also really kind of grim and gruesome and... Uh, God help me if I ever see this ghost. Yeah, so <laughs> this is... The blood-curdling screams of the Countess of Salisbury. Now, we already kind of mentioned that there weren't nearly as many executions at the Tower of London as, you know, history, you know, the, the gossip. As people believe. As yeah. you might believe. So there was true that was only six people were actually beheaded at the Tower of London. Of course, the most famous of all was Anne Boleyn. But the second most famous was a woman by the name of Margaret Pohl. She was the Countess of Salisbury. And it was actually far more gruesome than Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn, she kind of went out a somewhat semi on her own terms. I mean, she... She asked for a, a sword that had versus an axe because she didn't want it botched. She didn't want it botched, and she, you know, she convinced Henry VIII to go ahead and pay to have a very, very skilled swordsman come over from France, I believe. Yes. So, yeah, it was quite the process. Um, she, um, and he was like, we'll get into that when we get to her. But yeah. the Countess, on the other hand, oh. this is the most botched execution ever. Oh, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. I forget yeah. they're talking about Yeah. Oops. All right, so, in what must be one of the most gruesome botched executions in recorded history, poor Margaret de la Pole, Countess of Salisbury, was imprisoned in the tower as an enemy of the state, get this, not for anything that she did, but after her son, a cardinal, denounced Henry VIII as the head of the Church of England. Unfortunately for Margaret, her son was in France, so Henry took out his rage on his mother. Margaret was sentenced to death as a Roman Catholic in Henry VIII's new Protestant England. Game of Thrones. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit of that. So, now, she did not take getting sentenced to death very lightly. When she made it to the scaffold, she refused to kneel, saying, So should traitors do, and I am none. As she was of noble birth, there were about 150 people there to witness the event. When the executioner raised his axe, she ran. The legend goes that he pursued her, hacking at her around the scaffold until she was dead. The ghostly screams of Margaret are frequently heard at the site of the scaffold. Some visitors have even claimed to witness a reenactment of the bloody event on the anniversary of her death, which became seen as a martyrdom. More than that, the shadow of the executioner's axe has been seen cast against the walls. I give her full props for not bowing to, zoo, to being killed as a traitor when she did nothing. But damn, what a way to go. Yeah, kind of brutal. Very gr brutal. It was, it was rough. It was, yeah. Yeah. But right. Henry got what he wanted. Henry did get what he wanted. Um, so the next one we have is a tourist sighting. Uh, she was actually wandering through the uh, tower rooms full of engravings, remembered some of the tower's many prisoners. Uh, and she was with a yeoman, and uh, he approached this woman and her daughter who were interested in the room's somber decorations. He happily explained to the daughter, who was perhaps 18, 19 years old, uh, and started wailing so, so much suffering. The warder was concerned, but his mother reassured him that sometimes she just picked up on vibes and would be alright soon. It would pass. They then proceeded into an area and around a former altar where the interesting engravings were to be found. So, so much suffering, the teenager wailed once more. Again, the warder tried to reassure her that they were all gone now. She then said, not him. The woman replied, putting a hand behind her as if touching a man's shoulder. She pointed to an engraving reading, Thomas, Thomas Talbot, 1498. 
She sees dead people. She does. And she saw Thomas Talbot. Yep. So, About 500 years dead. 500 years dead, and uh, apparently he appears to young females. I don't know why, but that's who sees him the most often. Now this one I just love. Could theorize over that all night. <laughs> this this one is kind. Of, this one's fun. This yeah. one's a little fun. <laughs> the Great Smoke Bear after the Crown Jewels. So perhaps the most bizarre phantom of the Tower of London is that of a bear that once lived in the Royal Menagerie. In 1210, King John established a menagerie of animals at the tower that were used in fights for spectators' amusement. Think like Colosseum type stuff, Roman Colosseum type thing. They, they were doing that at the Tower of London in the 1200s. The awful practice was incredibly popular with the people, and over the years it transitioned into a kind of a zoo where visitors could see strange beasts from all around the world, including even a polar bear. Well, the Duke of Wellington eventually moved the animals to the London Zoo in 1832, some believe that the troubled spirits of beasts from years past still haunt the tower. Visitors have reported the cries of animals, including lions and monkeys. Now. The Martin Tower used to hold the crown jewels, and it was always under guard. One night, the soldier on duty saw smoke creeping out from under the door of the tower. Going to investigate, he saw the smoke gather into the form of a great gray bear. The terrified guard reacted with valor, charging the spectral animal with his bayonet. The weapon dispelled the beast, but lodged so deep into the door that it took two men to remove. The soldier died two days after the incident. Hard to say from what. Died of fright? Right, or I wonder if something got him when he lodged that if he, spear. If he, if he impaled ran, himself. <laughs> impaled, or um, bludgeoned himself in the, in the gut, running into the van. Yeah, that, that, that who, part's who, unclear. Who, I mean, yep. this was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. So, the bear story remains unexplained. Some say it was paranormal propaganda with Britain at war with Russia at the time. Russia, the bear, yeah, there you go. Others have speculated the spirit of a dead animal once mistreated in the tower's menagerie. This chilling tale has been told and retold over the years, and many now say that the bear was no less the, than the devil in ghostly disguise, pulling the hapless to the underworld with him. Yeah. Ghost smoke bears. Ghost smoke bears. After shiny things. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody likes shiny. All right, so the next one is actually King Henry the uh, Like many grisly deaths in the power, Henry the Sixth met his end as a result of a real game of life of the Game of Thrones. Uh, he was the only child of Henry V. He stood to inherit the English and French thrones, and yet Henry's life was plagued by royal skirmishes. In 1471, as the War of the Roses raged throughout England, Henry the Sixth was imprisoned by the House of York at the Tower of London. Though initial reports claim that Henry died broken-hearted of illness in the tower on May 21st of 1371, <coughs> truth is more likely a very sinister act. Uh, soon after Richard of York's son, Edward cedes control of the throne after the Battle of Trucusbury, excuse me, uh, the newly minted ruler allegedly called for Henry VI's assassination. Henry was stabbed to death as he knelt in prayer in the Wakefield Tower. Every anniversary of his death, his ghost is said to appear pacing around the exact spot where he met his grisly end, and at the last stroke of midnight, he disappears. I absolutely want to go do an investigation at the Tower of London, by the way. <laughs> I really do. As far as I know, they don't allow it. Yeah, and you'd have to get in line. Yeah, I would. But I don't think they'd allow an American investigator in over a British investigator. Yeah, highly unlikely. But maybe we could be guests. Could you work on your accent? I could. You've done it before. I have. I another, so have. Another story for another time. <laughs> All right, so finally, dear old Queen Anne. Queen, yeah, oh yes, Queen Anne Boleyn, yes. So, um, she was the second wife of Henry VIII. Uh, Aunt Queen Anne Boleyn is perhaps the most famous ghost in all of the Tower of London. She was accused of adul adultery and incest with her brother George. Mind you, not true, but anyways... Queen Anne was beheaded at the tower on the 19th of May in 1536. Shortly before her execution, she told the crowd not to blame her husband, who, as we know, had invented these charges so that he could remarry in his futile search for a male heir. Anne is usually seen near the site of her execution, which is now the Queen's house. 
a house Henry built for Anne and near the altar in the chapel where her body lies. She appears close to the site where she was executed and has also been seen leading a procession down the aisle of a chapel. One guard tells a story of seeing a hooded figure approach him in the rooms of the tower. Despite orders to stop, the hooded figure advanced, leaving the guard to run it through with his bayonet. At that point, the guard realized the figure was missing its head. Guards have a habit of trying to... Charge with bayonets. Through ghosts. They, they, they haven't figured this one out yet. Or, I don't know, is it part of their training? Is that what they do? I don't know. I'm not a yeoman. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so as I mentioned, Anne's decapitated body was originally buried beneath the floor of St. Peter's Chapel. In 1876, Queen Victoria ordered that the bodies in the chapel should be exhumed and buried more appropriately. A short while later, one of the captains of the guard was patrolling the tower at night and saw a strange flickering light in the chapel. He climbed, one of the, climbed up to one of the windows and pressed his face against the glass. He was amazed by what he saw. Inside the chapel, he saw a procession of lords, ladies, and knights in armor. At the center of the festivity was a small, delicately dressed woman. Later, he identified her as being Anne Boleyn herself. He remained at the window, transfixed by this strange and otherworldly scene. After a few minutes, the lights in the chapel faded, and the procession of ghosts disappeared into thin air. The captain of the guard was left gazing through the window of a dark and empty old church. The ghost of Anne has been spotted in many different parts of the Tower of London, both roaming inside of the buildings and outside upon the Tower Green. It's said that her headless torso paces through the tower at night and is most frequently spotted in the chapel of St. Peter, where she was buried following her execution. And in 1864, it's recorded that a soldier guarding the tower saw the terrifying headless figure of Anne panicked and tried to stab it with his bayonet. Again. The dagger, of course, went straight through her ghostly figure. The soldier fainted from fright and was about to be court-martialed for being asleep on duty. However, many other guards came forward and claimed they'd also seen the ghost of Anne whilst on night duty. As a result, the soldier was dis had all charges dismissed. I really have to wonder if Anne looks at them like, seriously, you're trying to stab me again. It's been, it's that, let's see, that would have been, it's like, come on, people, it's like, it's been four, three, four hundred years. Can, can we get with the program here? Can, can we stop? Leave, leave me, leave There's me. There's nobody here. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Anne is all over the place there. And she, yeah, very, very prominent location. Yeah. All right, so the White Tower, which is the tower that everybody recognizes, it's the round tower that's white with the nice cupola on the top. Um... This holds the White Lady in it, and it's the keep at the heart of the Tower of London. Uh, this is a terrifying fact for everybody. Every castle keep in England seems to be haunted by one common ghost, the specter of a woman either dressed in white or black robes. These white women or black women are featured in countless tales. They haunt all manner of castles from Warwick to Goodrich to Tamworth to Leeds. So she gets around. Whether it's the same ghost or not, we don't know. <laughs> but it starts to make you wonder, why do you always hear about the white woman or the black woman? You kind of, you do kind of have those stories. They're not just there, it's all over the globe. Oh, yeah. There, there's, there's, there's always, there's the, the woman in black or the woman in blue or something like that. Mm -hmm. Where, the, you know, they That's just... That's what they're dressed in. Yeah. So, my guess is that they are all different spirits, that it's not actually the same You know, it's one. not a, hin a hidden ghost cult. You're not going to comment on that one. <laughs> I'm intrigued by the theory. Carry okay, on. Carry on. on. All right, so the white uh, woman of the Tower of London is actually scarier than most of the ghosts there. Often visitors glimpse a figure in white and out of the corner of their eyes. Then quite suddenly they smell a terrible pungent smell of old, overpowering perfume. Some visitors then describe the feeling of the world closing in around them, chills running down their neck, and into their spine. In recent years, tourists in the tower have reported the sensation that something is tapping them on the shoulder. When they turn around, there's absolutely nothing there. Just a wisp of white which disappears into the periphery of their vision. She is said to have stood once at a window waving to little children at the building at the opposite side. Now, I will say, I have been to the Tower of London, and in that tower, I did smell a really horrific old perfume. <laughs> I did not know anything about this until I read it, and I'm thinking to myself, 
First of all, was there anybody else in that tower with me when I was in there? Um, you know, trying to debunk, and I cannot remember if there were other people in the room with me when I was in there, and I smelled it. So I don't know. But strong old perfume smells set off my migraines, and I did leave the Tower of London that day with a migraine. <laughs> All right, good old Henry the Eighth. Henry the Eighth again, because well, he's Henry. He's Henry. <laughs> Very famous for beheading his wives, divorcing his wives, right. for never being satisfied, creating his own church because he couldn't get a divorce, because he couldn't get a male heir. Epitome of selfishness. Epitome of selfishness. He was quite the character. So, anyways. Henry VIII's armor is actually still on display in, in, at the Tower of London complex. And this, this is later armor, just so later, you know. Yeah. The big armor. Yes. So specifically, this is at the White Tower, and it's the oldest of all the tower structures. Visitors report a horrifying, crushing sensation as they enter the gallery where Henry VIII's armor is stored. The minute they leave the building, the feeling disappears. And this happens in whatever room the armor's in. So it's not just the room, it's wherever the armor's located. And it goes a little beyond this, is that some of the guards have even also reported being physically accosted by some unseen force. One was covered and strangled by a heavy cloak, only to find once he freed himself that he was alone. Another stopped to rest his feet and removed his shoes when a voice behind him whispered, There's only you and I here. Whether the spirit in the tower is Henry VIII himself or some other malevolent being, we wouldn't recommend a trip to the White Tower alone. Guards of the Tower of London have reported having a terrible crushing sensation upon them. And uh, that's a duplicate paragraph. Oh, Sorry. Oops. oops. I didn't delete that. <laughs> yep. Typo. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, the, the, the armor is enormous. If you ever go look pictures up of it, the thing is huge. So it's very menacing looking. You can imagine why people feel these horrible feelings around it, not to mention just knowing the history of Henry VIII and his temper. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yes. And rolling on with more Henry VIII related material. Uh, actually, no. Lady Jane Grey comes after Henry's well, son. Mm, well, yeah. she has a connection. Yes. So um, after Henry passes on, of course, his only son inherits. And um, he was always a sickly boy. He was always... Um, considered he probably wouldn't live long, and he didn't. He died in his teens. Um, but uh, they tried to figure out who was going to take the throne after him. Now, if you go in the order of succession, Mary is next, followed by Elizabeth. But because Mary is Catholic, people did not want her ruling England at this point in time. So they looked for a pro Protestant alternative. And since both Mary and Elizabeth had been declared Ill illegitimate at this point in time, they looked for a legitimate um, successor, and that is Lady Jane Grey, uh, and her husband, Guilford Dudley. So, uh, the day Lady Jane Grey's relatives conceived uh, and convinced her that she was the rightful heir to the throne of England was the day she signed her death warrant. Uh, she was the great-granddaughter of Henry VII. A group of men tried to put Jane forward as the rightful queen, but Henry VIII's daughter, Mary I, had other ideas. When she married Philip of Spain and was crowned queen, she sentenced Lady Jane and her husband, Guilford Dudley, to death. Now, Lady Jane actually ruled as queen for eight days. She's known as the eight-day queen. Uh, she was only 16 years old at the time of her execution, and numerous male members of her family were also beheaded at the tower, including her husband. After his execution, uh, Guilford Dudley's remains were carted past the room where Lady Jane was being held. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly she witnessed and knew that she was about to meet the same fate. At the scaffold, she was blindfolded and had trouble locating the chopping block, asking, What shall I do? Where is it? The Bocab Tower, Dudley's ghost is said to sit, weeping at uh, night, at long into the night, and people claim he is responsible for the word Jane that is etched into the walls and still visible today. As for Jane, she spotted in 1957 a lonely figure walking amongst the battlements. I actually would like to go back and find where Jane is written. I did not see that hmm. when I was there. Yeah. One thing I'm curious about reading through all these stories back to back is how do they identify who was Lady Jane versus who was Anne Boleyn? Oh, I guess Anne Boleyn, headless torso. Details, faceless. But faceless. But there's so many of these various spirits, they attribute them specifically to being one person. Mm -hmm. I wonder how, they, how people decide to identify who exactly it is. 
Is there something behind me? There is a bug. Oh, okay. I just shoot it away. Okay. But anyways, <laughs> I, w I wonder how they decide to f and figure out who they are. I, I think it has to do with where they're haunted. Uh, haunting, I should say. Hmm. And who has the most likely connection. Like, Anne always prays in the chapel every single day. Right. That makes so, sense. And she was buried there. Yep. So, got one more for you. And this is Lady Arbella Stewart. Uh, she was the second cousin of Queen Elizabeth I, and she secretly married William Seymour, the nephew of Lady Jane Grey. She made King, when she did this, she made King James I very angry. The marriage was thought of as a threat because it did not have the permission of King James, and Arabella was put under house arrest in Lambeth while her husband William was sent to the tower. So you have to remember, historically at this time, if you're of a certain rank, you need permission of the reigning monarch to marry. She was of that rank. She didn't do it. Her bad. <laughs> Very bad. So Arabella, and now, now it gets a little worse for Arabella. Instead of just kind of rolling with this and saying, oh, well, that was a mistake. She, not asking forgiveness. Yeah, not asking for, biz, for forgiveness. She starts plotting to get William released so that they could travel together to France. However, William missed the rendezvous. Arabella set sail all alone, but she was recognized and was sent back, this time to the tower. William, on the other hand, made it to freedom in Flanders. He would never see his wife again. Arabella stayed in the Queen's house, supposedly she refused to eat, and died at the tower in 1615. It is believed that she was murdered in the castle. Like Queen Anne Boleyn, Lady Arabella was said to haunt the Queen's house. The governor of the tower, who lived in those rooms from 1994 to 2006, reported a disturbing event in which his wife was pushed so violently by some unseen force that it propelled her out of the room and on to, into the hallway. Others have reported sightings of her heartbroken ghost on the grounds on the tower of the tower weeping. There's a lot of unhappy women in the tower. That's like that's a that's a totally that's a Romeo and Juliet oh, it is. type thing going on there. Let's run away. Secret marriage. Let's run away. Let's escape the, the negativity and those that hate us. And we both end up well, one of us ends up dead. Yeah. What, what happened to him? I don't know. We have to look it up. Hmm. Be interesting. I figured this was long enough as it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because guy. Oh wow, it's uh, already seven. Yeah. Nine. So now we need to go to Hampton Court. Yes. Um, so we're going to cut this down um, with the official history and jump right to the ghosts. Uh, but this was um, Hampton Court Palace. It uh, swarms with royal ghosts. Catherine Howard, who was uh, another wife of Henry VIII, is the most famous ghost here, but she's not the only ghost. Um, it was uh, part of the Knights of Hospitallers of St. John Jerusalem who acquired the, man the manor of Hampton in 1236 and used the house as an a grange or a site for their agricultural estates. Uh, so that was the start of this. And it continues passing through until the, another more famous um, person actually becomes the owner, and that is Cardinal Wolseley. And those of you that know your Henry VIII history, he was the advisor to Henry VIII in the early days before Henry broke with um, the Catholic Church and, and started the Church of England. and also executed rules like <laughs> um, but he was one of the most again more famous um, owners of the place now after um, Wolseley took over the place he added private chambers for his own use plus three suites for the royal family for King Henry the uh, eighth Queen Catherine of Aragon and their daughter Princess Mary uh, so it became a place for delegations to be held uh, and unfortunately then Wolseley fell from grace. Um, this then was thought to be too grand a place for the cleric, so Wolseley uh, was removed and this became a royal residence at that point in time. Now, uh, Henry also added on and he finished all his add-ons in 1540 uh, and it was one of the most modern, sophisticated, magnificent uh, places in England at that point in time. Uh, and he actually reigned there until 1547. This is not Henry VIII, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is his daddy. <laughs> um, now, uh, when Henry VIII came in to play, he also lived here and uh, took over the palace as well. And uh, his surviving children actually lived there. Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth all lived there. Um, 
and they would each rule England. Hampton Court would continue to play a major part in their lives. Um, after Elizabeth died, uh, King James of Scotland actually came, became James the first, and uh, he actually staged court entertainments there, dramatic performances there. Uh, it, it was a, it continued to be a major part of the royal life at that point in time, and this was also a keen place for hunting, and James was a huntsman. He loved to go out hunting. Um, it became a royal leisure center and served as the venue for the plays, the dances, the banquets, the mass, um, including William Shakespeare performed there, because James was his patron. <laughs> um, now, um, James's Queen Anne died there in 1619, so we do have a royal death there. Mm -hmm. And um, it just continues on. Charles I was there and lived there. And Charles II, Charles II, wow, I need to talk more. <laughs> I thought you were skipping history. I did, I'm just going through it briefly. Okay. I'm skipping a lot. Anyway, so um, <laughs> he lived there as well. And uh, after that, Queen Anne lived there from 1702 uh, to 1714. Those of you who uh, may have watched The Favorite, this is the palace that they're in. Um, there's a lot of history here. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go on to the. Uh, finally, the last queen who lives there is Victoria. Um, and she lives there between uh, 1837 and 1901. And at, she is the one who actually orders that this should now be opened up to the public. So she makes it a palace that you can go and visit. Um, and that's what it is today. It yep. is upkept and it, you know, you're allowed to go in and visit. You are not allowed to take photo uh, photographs inside. It is to protect the antiques that are in there. And we'll get to a, um, a gentleman who disobeyed that rule and what he caught. Yes. So Hampton Court definitely is one of the most visited locations in all of England, uh, and it's no, it is less known for its ghostly residence than some of the other royal palaces, but it is unique in that it has never been properly investigated. So there have never, ever, ever been any paranormal investigations allowed on the site, and as we already mentioned, no photography is technically allowed either, although some people have bent that rule. Now, You're actually escorted off the property if you pull out your camera and you take pictures. Yes. Now, the first ghost that we're going to talk about is yet another wife of Henry VIII. <laughs> this one is Catherine Howard. Now, Catherine Howard was a little bit of a party animal. And, um, yeah, she she made a serious misstep. Uh, she was him. 17 when she married Henry. He was an old man at this point in time. He, she was and his she fifth was wife. she was not happy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, the stories about her haunting location have proliferated through 100, 450 years after her execution. The stories were so well known that by 1918, when the palace opened to the public, the space associated with Catherine's story was already known as the Haunted Gallery. She is believed to frequent Hampton Court's Haunted Gallery, where she was dragged back screaming to her rooms while under house arrest, accused of committing adultery by her husband, King Henry VIII. Mind you, this accusation of adultery, unlike Anne Boleyn, was true. true. So, over the centuries, visitors and palace staff have reportedly reported multiple ghostly encounters in the gallery. Some witnesses claim to have seen Catherine running in terror and others claim to have heard her screams. I think this is kind of doing her dirty a little bit because she does have a very interesting fact about her. When she was sentenced to death, um, she is imprisoned and the night before her execution she has the poise and the conviction she actually requested that the chopping block be brought to her prison cell so that she could practice laying her head on the chopping block so that she wouldn't fumble about at the execution the following day. She wanted to be graceful queen of steam, just like Anne Boleyn. Yes, so it definitely that kind of runs counter to the whole uh, running and screaming in terror through the halls of Hampton Court. But anyways, to, well, this, another night, another yeah. day. <laughs> to this day, visitors report unexpected sightings, sounds, and smells, and feeling as though they cross the haunted gallery. In 1999, during separate tours of the palace, two female visitors fainted on exactly the same spot in the haunted gallery, approximately half an hour apart. Now, I haven't been to Hampton Court. It's one of the places I've always wanted to visit, so that's something personal I'm going to have to go check out yeah. at some point. Oh, darn. Trip to England. Here we come. Hello. I'm going to go and skip to Skeletor. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to move along to this next one. Skeletor. This is the famed closed-circuit um, closed television ghost. 
So on three consecutive nights in the winter of 2003, Hampton Court Palace security staff were alerted to the opening of a fire door, the same door near the clock court. When they arrived at the location, they found the doors closed. Mystified, they examined closed-circuit TV footage and were astonished when the camera showed the heavy doors opening apparently of their own volition. On all three nights, the closed-circuit TV footage clearly showed the fire doors opening with great force. However, on the second night, a figure wearing a long coat appeared and proceeded to pull the door shut. The identity of this figure, which was nicknamed Skeletor, became the subject of intense debate, with some even claiming it might be the ghost of one of Hampton Court's most famous former residents, Henry VIII himself. It wasn't just the security staff that had witnessed this ghostly figure. On the second day, the same day of the recording, a visitor had left a comment in the visitor book detailing her sighting of a spectral figure in the same area. Now, Skeletor, where did they come up with this? They drew a line between pop culture, modern pop culture, and what they were seeing here. If you think, if you've ever seen the He-Man He comics <laughs> and the Skeletor figure from He-Man comics, apparently somebody drew that comparison and hence the nickname Skeletor. Uh, now, Jane Seymour III of Henry and Wives also haunts Hampton Court. Uh, she is actually seen wandering through the palace and its cobbled uh, courtyards carrying a lighted taper to reflect the tragedy of that befell her at the par uh, palace. She actually died at Hampton Court in 1537 following the complications after the birth of Edward, Henry VIII's only son. Uh, so she is seen wandering around with the taper through the hallways, maybe possibly looking for her child that she has never seen after she died. Uh, now, the lucky shots that appeared here, we did mention a photographer who um, snuck his camera out after other guests had left the room that they were in and, and took a couple of pictures, and he caught several uh, apparitions and orbs. So the um, first one, uh, this was an August weekend in Hampton Court Palace, and Trevor Ty is the photographer who caught these things. He was standing in the main public entrance waiting 45 minutes for the area to clear of tourists before he took the shot. Um, in the untouched photography, you can see on the gallery what appears to be a small girl with blonde locks wearing a white-colored patent dress. And there is an orb also in the area. That is a question. Now, when he enhanced the photo, uh, basically brightened it to show more definition within the shadows, what you see is actually a second figure to the left facing um, of the girl and appears to be wearing a dark full-length gown and a skull cap. So many believe that she is a royal, and that gentleman wearing a skull cap is Cardinal Wolseley, who used to own Hampton Court. Uh, he, of course, Trevor was asked to leave afterwards by Hampton Court staff because, again, the photography is not allowed, so he was escorted off of the property. And uh, when he took a look at the, the photographs and he saw what he saw, he actually sent them the photographs. Uh, and asked them if they would con content on it. Um, and he, the staff confirmed that the child ghost of a young girl had been seen here, and even the security officer later confirmed that he had also seen her. Of course the girl has got to be royal. Nobody can confirm who she was in life. Uh, but the second figure is also intriguing because it's the first time that Cur Cardinal Wolseley seems to have been captured. So Chris has got the photos. He's going to show them to you. Uh, actually, the... Or, sorry. Do I you want to show them on that? that? That's probably a better definition. Oh, I can see. Because I, I left the photos in the script because I thought they were really cool. Yeah, so that's the one we'll see there. I don't know if you all will be able to see this. Let's kind see. of. A little bit of glare. Yeah, so you can see the, the girl really clearly right here. But that is Wolseley right there. Yeah. And if you want to go ahead and bring up the picture for yourself, you could probably just do an internet search of Trevor Ty. Trevor Ty. And it's T-Y-E. T-Y-E. And uh, Trevor Ty Hampton Court Ghost. And you'll probably be able to go ahead and just Google that picture and find it. Yeah. So, and speaking of looking things up, uh, thank you to, uh, to Patrick there, uh, who in, the, in our comments section put a link to the Wikipedia post for Skeletor. So if you're, if you're not familiar with... Um, with, with the character Skeletor from He-Man, you can go check it out there and see, see what, what Skeletor it is that we're talking looks about. like. 
Um, so now we're going to jump over to Hawaii, to the yes. Iolani Palace. Yes. So, uh, and the Iolani Palace was the main Hawaiian residence uh, for the last two monarchs of Hawaii. Um, and uh, Hawaii, of course, um, d was one of the last states to join the American United States. It was annexed because they wanted um, the, the pineapple trade, the um, uh, sugar, especially the sugar cane trade that Hawaii had, and so we took over hostily a, um, a royal residence, royal country at that point in time, uh, and we imprisoned the monarch, uh, Lilio Kalana, who was the last queen of Hawaii. Uh, I'm going to butcher some of these names, and I apologize in advance. Even though I've been there, I have forgotten how to pronounce some of these names. So, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but this is another great palace that you can go and visit. They are in the process of restoring it uh, fully, uh, but it is absolutely amazing. And I actually had to do a, a full <laughs> report on this for my American history class when I returned. Work in the system. <laughs> um, now, it's the it's not the only historical place, uh, but it's also very sacred for many of the islanders. There's actually seven royal residences or um, places that are using part of royal residences today that are still standing, this is one of them. Um, the family, again, was um, the Hawaiian kings and queens lived here until the annexation and were imprisoned here uh, when they were forced from their home in 1893. That's when the annexation happened. Um, this was a burial ground also for Hawaiian nobility and uh, as well as a small community for native islanders. The estate was known as Hana, Hana Lalai Holoi. And there was a temple called Keomani Hawat, Keohana Mawali. There's a lot of vowels in here. Don't ask me to help you with this. <laughs> Had also existed. The thing I learned about Hawaiian language when you go there is you have to pronounce everything. It's not easy. I'm like French. It's like Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, um, Originally what had been uh, here eventually got uh, destroyed and King Kamehameha III brought the la uh, bought the land in 1844 and actually built the current palace that is there. Again, there's a ton of history here that you can look up, but because we're running late, we're going to kind of um, condense it. Um, the current structure that uh, you see today is designed by Thomas J. Baker under the uh, direction of Kalokea, also known as King David. Uh, it would be completed in 17, uh, 1879, and only David and his successor, Queen Lilio Kalani, ruled from here. It was overthrown by the U.S. government, and as I said, in 1893, to gain control of the sugar, chocolate, and coffee industries. Uh, nearly the entire royal, royal family was evicted from the palace, save the queen and the dowager queen, Kakpa Kalani, uh, and a few servants. The two women were imprisoned here in 1895 and placed on trial. Lilio Kalana was sentenced to death for plotting against the U.S. government's attempted overthrow, and the sentence was commuted after she abdicated her throne. We weren't very nice. No. Mm. Uh, the palace was then renamed as the executive building under the now defunct royal family and was forced into the Washington Palace. Their former home was turned into the Capitol building, then a military headquarters and the governor's office until it became too small to house these governmental entities. The building was ravaged in the 1930s when the building materials were needed elsewhere and the palace fell into disrepair. Uh, the restoration efforts began in the 1960s and it was declared a National Historic Landmark, so it's been preserved since then. It was made public again in 1978 as a museum and exhibits the outlining of the history of the monarchy of Hawaii and the restoration efforts and the imprisonment of the queen and the annexation of Hawaii. So they do not gloss over that at all. Yes, they shouldn't. No. Um, <laughs> a lot of the original objects that had been um, lost from the, the palace actually have been restored or returned if they have been found. In fact, there's one story of a gentleman who was taking a tour of the palace who saw a photograph of a table. It was a circular table that could bend upright to make storage against the wall a whole lot easier, but then you could turn it down and you could use it as a table. And uh, he mentioned that this was a very familiar looking object. He thought it was back at home. And uh, they mm -hmm. told him exactly how to discover if it was the same table and the markings that would be on it. He wrote it down and he went home 
he took a picture of it, he sent it to them, he said, are these the correct markings? And they said, yes, they are. He then gifted it back to the palace and to the people of Hawaii, so they have it. Um, so that's one of the remarkable um, stories of how one of the pieces got back into the palace that belongs there. And it now stands exactly next to the photograph that he recognized it in. Uh, now, the palace itself, uh, various royal ghosts have been seen here and heard here. Most of the Ferguson sightings revolve around uh, Queen Luliokalani. Uh, it is her love for her country and her home that has kept her spirit here in the palace. Uh, she is said to haunt the grounds, including playing songs on her favorite piano, which is still in the palace today. Uh, and um, It's kept in a glass case so that nobody can touch it. Yeah, and to protect it. Uh, but people have actually reported hearing the piano sound, but also if they happen to hear it sounding, uh, they will walk up to the piano, they will see the keys moving. Now this is not a mecha mechanized piano at all. Uh, so the fact that she is seen actually playing the, the piano is really remarkable. The fact that she has the energy to be able to move those keys is mm -hmm. remarkable. Uh, she was also a well-known cigar smoker, and you can often smell the, um, the smoke of the cigars and see the smoke of the cigars. Even the palace is a smoke-free museum. Um, you will smell them, and if you do smell them, you know she's around you, so just bow and, and be gracious. And it's particularly around her statue, actually. Yeah. That's where they see this and see this and smell this the most. So that, that's where they draw the very short line between what the occurrences are and the queen. Now, she's also seen uh, dressed in a black dress, which is something she often wore as soon as she was imprisoned. And uh, it is seen in the dressing room, where she, that was just off of her bedroom. So you see her in there, moving to the bedroom and back again. Um, th she's not the only ghost. Voices and footsteps also are heard in the empty palace by security guards. Those who work uh, in one of the palace auxiliary buildings have reported everything from lights turning on and off by themselves to eerie sensations to other noises they can't explain. Disembodied lights and orbs have also been witnessed and photographed all over the grounds at various times during the day. According to storyteller uh, Lapika Kapanu, uh, the owner of the Mysteries of Hawaii Tours, uh, if you want to glimpse Queen Liliokalani, you actually have to stop by the palace grounds around 5.30 in the morning and you just might see her ghostly figure. Uh, that is when most of the palace guards actually report that she is seen looking out through the windows of the palace on the second floor over the grounds. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, of course he also confirms with the guards that they hear her playing the piano in what is known as the blue room where her play, uh, piano is currently stored. Uh, some, uh, some people who visit who have the royal bloodlines uh, through their ancestry are more likely to actually see her. Um, they actually will also hear some of the other ghosts who are uh, the old um, uh, village members before this became a palace. They are heard to be chanting um, and dancing actually on the, um, the property, but the music is actually heard up in the second floor bedroom, which is kind of weird that it's heard above the ground level. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you have to have the, the Hawaiian royal bloodline to be able to hear that. It's only those who hear them. Um, there are other places that are connected to the royal family that are haunted. Um, the, the storyteller also uh, recalls one night where he brought a group of um, tourists on one of his ghost tours down to the Honolulu downtown area in 2006. There is a statue of King Kamehameha not too far from the palace. Um, it's actually right across the street, uh, and he actually says from that vantage point they spotted a silhouette of a Hawaiian woman peering out from the window of the Iolani second floor bedroom. Uh, again, they believe this is the bedroom where Lily Okalana was imprisoned, and it's possibly her ghost. Um, unfortunately, nobody was able to snap a picture of it, but several of them saw it. Um, now, this is a palace that's not going to confirm any of these ghost stories, just to let you know that. So if you go in and go and ask, you're going to get the cold shoulder. Um, they do not embrace it like the Tower of London does. Unfortunately. Yeah. But. Uh, I will say there are definitely certain rooms. I, as I said, I, I have visited this palace. Um, there are certain rooms that where the energy is very clearly different. It's very electric. Uh, so you know something's in that room. Um, 
There's also a sacred mound and a fenced in area on the palace grounds that is a burial site uh, for King Kamehameha II and Queen Kamamulali. Uh, they died of the measles shortly after a trip to England between eight, uh, 1825 and 1865. Uh, and so there you're always told you can never go on this mountain. It is sacred. Do not touch it. Bad things happen when you do go on it. Uh, there's a kapu sign warning visitors to stay away from the sacred and forbidden site. And the idea of kapu is that if you disregard it, it's similar to Robert the Doll. If you disregard it, if you disgrace it in any way, bad shit will happen to you. And most of the time it is death in some way horrible. Uh, so you don't mess with Kapu on Hawaiian Islands. Hawaii, Hawaii is beautiful, very, very beautiful. But don't mess with the spirits. Do don't mess not. with the goddess, none of it. <laughs> yeah, there's, we could do a whole night on Hawaii. Oh, I plan on doing a whole Hawaiian, night on Hawaii. Hawaiian, Hawaiian, Hawaiian curses. <laughs> I have several that. books. Yes. <laughs> I have two books. <laughs> All right, so the other palace that we're going to talk about is Queen Emma's palace. And Queen Emma actually was good friends with Queen Victoria. They both ruled at the same time. And they had very similar storylines with their lifetime. Um, both queens, neither, neither one of them was ever thought to become queen, but by a, a rema remarkable stroke of luck, both of them became queen. Uh, queen Emma married into it, Queen Victoria inherited. Uh, both women lost their husbands at a very young age. Both women suffered the loss of um, loved ones. In this case, Queen Emma lost her son, her only child, very young, and uh, lost her husband young as well. Um, now, the, the palace that is haunted is her summer palace. It was a retreat for Queen Emma during 1857 and 1885, as well as for her uh, husband, King Kamehameha IV. Uh, their son was Prince Albert Edward. A name that, I can pronounce. Yeah, if that doesn't ring a bell, Prince Albert. Hmm, I think Queen Victoria had a Prince Albert who was her firstborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not a coincidence. Not at all. So now it's a historic landmark. The palace is a historic landmark today, a museum and a tourist site, and it's uh, located in um, Pali Highway, less than a 10-minute drive outside of downtown Honolulu. I did not visit this because I did not know about it when I was in Hawaii. I need to go back. I need to take him back <laughs> because there's so much I didn't explore when I was just in high school. I won't object. I've never been. So. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's uh, a very popular location for... Um, you know, first for uh, Hawaii, a very long, it was popular, uh, excuse me, hmm. it was long a popular location for Hawaiian chiefs and royalty and later for non-Hawaiian residents who found the cooler climate of the uplands more comfortable than downtown Honolulu. The well, Hawaiian name means either the Southern Cross or is the name of a benevolent goddess. I am not going to try to pronounce this. Hanaya Kamalaya? Kamala? Lama? Hanaya Kamalaya. Kamalama. Yeah. Hanaya, Hanaya Kamalama. As I said, you have to pronounce every single syllable in Hawaiian language. I say bless you to half of them. So, anyway, so the, rough, rough <laughs> translation, the Southern Cross. Um, now, the, this is really cool because the fr it was a frame of a home that was actually built in Boston in 1848 and then shipped to Hawaii via Cape Horn. So it made the big loop around and over. And uh, was assembled on the property purchased by John Lewis uh, mm -hmm. from the Kingdom of Hawaii. And it had six rooms. It was all one story, a porch with Doria columns and Greek revival style. In 1852, two years after it was complete, the home was purchased at auction by Kiana Anna, or John Young II, for $6,000. He owned the state until 1857 when he gave it to his niece, Queen Emma. And in 1869, Queen Emma added the large room called the Edinburgh Room near the rear of the structure in preparation, preparation for the visit of the Duke of Edinburgh. If you haven't figured it out yet, even though Hawaii was a, um, you know, a, a independent. independent country in, an, in its own right with its own monarchy and that, they had a lot of very close ties with uh, Great Britain and, for that matter, with the United States as well. Just kind of a sad case that the United States came and stomped all over the place later on, but there were there were tight connections there, as you can kind of see. The many of the people had two names. They had their native Hawaiian name, and they had a more English name, name as well. And uh, and well, then of course Queen Emma added the Edinburgh Room mm -hmm. to her to yeah. her structure. So, yeah. Now Queen Emma died in 1885, and that is when the Kingdom of Hawaii actually brought 
bought the estate, so it became part of the Royal Palace estate. In 1911, the territorial governor, Walter F. Fear, declared it a park, now to be maintained by the city and the country county, uh, county of Honolulu. At one point, plans were made to build a baseball park over the site. However, the Daughters of Hawaii were able to uh, persuade them not to do this and acquired the building, and thus it was preserved and saved, and now is a National Register of Historic Places. And that happened in the 1970s, so yeah. it will never be torn down at this point in time. So today it displays Queen Anna's possessions along with those of her husband uh, and their son and other members of the Hawaiian royal families. So if you go online, you can actually see pictures of these. There's a lot of um, artifacts in there, wardrobe artifacts, including, which I find really interesting, um, there was actually a uh, feather cape um, that was given to England. Uh, as, a, as a gesture, and it survived a bombing in the blitz. So you can actually see the soot on the feathers, and it made its way back to Hawaii, so they have it. There's also a koa uh, cradle there that was uh, presented by Queen Victoria to uh, Queen Emma for her son. Unfortunately, it arrived a few days after her son had died. Yeah. yeah. Now, and a different, another interesting gift. Now, it's worth noting that Queen Emma actually did leave the country on occasion um, because she did, at least at one point in time, take a trip to France where she met Napoleon III, and he gifted her a stereo opticon, uh, basically kind of like a, a precursor to a photograph type thing. Yeah. So that is there at the uh, Palace on Exhibit as well. So she, was, um, she did some traveling in her own right. Yeah, so there's a lot of different cool artifacts there. Um, now... As I mentioned, she was of royal blood, but she wasn't expected that she would become queen. Uh, unfortunately, she ended up marrying her husband, King Kamehameha IV, and uh, gave birth to her son, Prince Albert. Unfortunately, he died very young, um, and it is with his death that she actually broke her um, connection with the royal family. Uh, it was actually act underneath Lilio Kalana and the former Dowager Queen, uh, that uh, her son was supposed to be being watched by and he died on their watch. So she never spoke to these women ever again. And she never supported either of them ever again. Uh, so there was a huge breach within the family at that point in time. Off. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just completely condensed the entire half page. Of it's history. been a day. Um, now, her brother-in-law actually takes over the, the throne, um, and it, it is his wife, and along with Lilio Kalana, who are the ones, uh, actually, who are supposed to be overseeing her son. Uh, Queen Emma actually dies, uh, at the age of 49 after a series of small strokes. Her funeral is one of the most well attended by any Hawaiian former monarch, and she was laid to rest in the royal mon uh, ma mausoleum with her son and her husband. Uh, the estate she lived on in the late years of her life was destroyed to build a coastal artillery batteries for the U.S. and the Summer Palace re it actually remains to be the, one of the only royal palaces where she ever lived. So we're lucky that we still have this. This uh, is the story of so many haunted locations, that, so many places that we're lucky to still have the history we left behind. Uh, so she is said to still roam the halls of the residence uh, where she enjoyed the fur. The brief years of happiness with her husband and her son. Her ghost is seen during the summer months because that's when they would have been in residence. Uh, the reason why they they moved here uh, during the summer months is the breezes uh, kept the uh, property much cooler than it did in downtown Hawaii uh, in Honolulu. Oh. Um, so uh, you really wanted to be where the breezes were. It's like why everybody left London in the summer. It was too hot and too stuffy and it's too smelly. Same yeah. thing in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> Even um, in paradise. Yeah. Um, Queen Emma... Um, not the only ghost. No, she's not the only ghost. Uh, the spirit of the dog that belonged to her four-year-old son is still seen roaming around the grounds as if it's waiting for his young master to return to him again. He, he died at the age of four. Uh, Uncle Joe uh, Espinata is uh, a lead guide for the Orbs of Oahu tour, and it is one of the company's most pop popular attractions to come to this palace. Uh, I'm going to actually read this because there's a lot of quotes here of what happened to him while they're on this tour at this location. Now, there's the stuff that nobody likes to talk about, and he's referring to the innocent loss of life, and that is the young Prince Albert. Um, 
Albert's mother, Emma, became queen in 1856. He was born two years later. Among the accomplishments of the queen, uh, she actually built the hospital to help the welfare of the Hawaiian people. Unfortunately, heartbreak soon fell upon Emma and her family in August of 1862 when Albert became sick and died at the age of four. In 1859, Emma established the Queen's Hospital and visited patients there almost daily whenever she was in residence in Oahu. You see, in the days of old when the royal died, the people of Oahu would plant a royal palm tree. Uncle Joe would say, walking his tour over to a large banyan tree with a palm tree growing out of the middle of it. This royal palm tree planted itself to let us know that a royal has passed on, Joe told the group. Adding to that tree, it should be dead because of its peculiar position. The banyan tree should have basically strangled it out, but it didn't. He points his flashlight to the branches and encourages the guests to take pictures with an attempt to capture orbs. Orbs which the branches then in, in, <clears throat> that Joe's tour focuses on are said to be the spirits of the individuals that show up as figures or balls of light in the photos. While guests snap away, Uncle Joe pulls out his camera and shows the tour an orb he captured here recently. He claims it is Queen Emma and Albert under the palm tree. He says he saw the apparitions for just three seconds and quickly took the supernatural shot. I wasn't scared or anything. He said he reminded the group to look at the photo with a very open mind and to make their own judgment. I don't know why she did it, but she did it. So that is Queen Emma, her son Albert, and the ghostly dog that uh, still romps through palace to this day. And proof that there is tragedy even in paradise. Yes. But very interesting stories, beautiful location, and fascinating history. Uh, we did have one of uh, our friend Patrick here. He chimed in uh, on the uh, the whole the connections between the Hawaiian people mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, so he said that the uh, the Anglicans, which were the High Church of England, who were members of the royal family in Hawaii before Americans went there. It was because they were loyal to Queen Elizabeth back in the day. After the U.S. came in, they were absorbed into the Episcopal Church in the United mm -hmm. States. So. And it's actually mentioned that Queen Emma was actually um, educated by missionaries from England. So that's not a connection that she yeah. has. But yeah, this, the world was getting smaller very rapidly in the 1800s with uh, you know, transportation getting mm -hmm. more efficient. And so uh, having those kinds of connections between place, places as far flung as Hawaii and Great Britain yeah. uh, was not uncommon. Uh, so, you know. Trade was up, so of course there was constant back and forth between the countries. Yeah, and this was, you got to remember, this was back in the day, that was before the Panama Canal. Yeah. And so, so they travel were, took a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, they were making the trips around the, the, the Cape of Good Hope, which is a very treacherous, a very ironic name in its own right. Uh, but yeah, so it's a very fascinating era in uh, world history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Lots yeah, going on. Definitely go. If you ever get the chance to go to Hawaii and visit these places, definitely go and see them. Check out the other palaces. I know one of the places I did not write down the name of it. Um, it's in my notes. <laughs> uh, but the palace is no longer there, but the bricks for the palace were used to construct a government building. Um, so there are still parts of the palace there. It's just in a new form. Repurpose, reuse. <laughs> Use what you got. Especially on an island nation. <laughs> yes. Very much so. Um, but those are our stories for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you enjoyed them. Next week, we are going to continue the stories. We're going to go back to Scotland and visit three castles there, as well as jump over to India, uh, we'll, France. We'll, we will need to edit it. We, who knows? This, <laughs> might turn, this might turn into a three-part because uh, we're... We also, we're way over tonight. We got uh, <laughs> France and Sweden, too. Yeah. So, yeah, we got Scotland, France, Sweden, India... Granted, they're nowhere near as long as we spent, gosh, 40 minutes on the Tower of London alone this evening. Yeah, that, there's a lot of ghosts at the Tower of London. But yeah. we'll edit it down so it's not quite, quite as long history-wise. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Okay. So, But yeah, just a tidal wave of information this past week. So we will look forward to uh, bringing you another episode next week as we uh, bring you the, uh, you know, the haunted palaces. continuation of Con the haunted palaces and royal residences. Haunted palaces, part two. So uh, with that, we will go ahead. We're going to go and scoot along this evening. Besides, the, the alcohol is basically gone. I'm going to sleep well tonight. I might have at least another shot.
Cheers. Now we gotta wrap up just so that I can go get another drink. But anyways, so <laughs> thank you very much for uh, thanks very much for tuning in and uh, oh yeah we're Patrick we're happy to do this every week uh, you know and uh, we appreciate you turning in tuning in every week. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just it's worth noting we are definitely going to be doing this at least for the next couple of weeks, I figure. Yeah. Um, and stay at home has been extended to yeah. the 14th. So. Yeah. And uh, even after we do manage to get kind of back to our business as usual of doing the tours, we do plan on doing this uh, at least once a month, maybe every couple of weeks. Um, um, once we kind depends of depends on how much research I can do when I'm back at my other job. Yeah. Yeah. We're, <laughs> I'll try to get ahead while I'm off. <laughs> yes. So we, we do have a mountain of information to share, but uh, yeah. it's going to be hard to accumulate information at the same rate that we have been once uh, things kind of start to go back to normal. Yeah, but the nice thing is. Is, is we have at least Creepy Dolls 2, 3, and 4. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Creepy Dolls out Nightmare there. Nightmare Fuel. Um, we have a lot of haunted hikes. I already have an idea for... Um, or a good section of research started for haunted lore and pop culture and where some of our haunted castles um, have played into pop culture. Uh, and, and there's also, as we said, where you can do a, we can just do a deeper dive into Hawaiian, specific locations, like yeah. Hawaiian, ho Hawaiian folklore and hauntings. Oh, there's going to be like a, just an Oregon hiking one, or just a Washington hiking one, because there's a lot of stuff there's there. a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, so, so I've got I got a ton of material. I just need to get it typed up, and I will. Yeah. So thanks again all for tuning in, uh, and uh, if uh, if you uh, want to uh, drop us a note or anything before mm -hmm. next week, uh, you can always just shoot us a note via Facebook. We're we stay on top of that. We like yep. chatting with y'all. Um, so drop us a line anytime. Yep, and we do have e-gift uh, e cards available on our website for um, our ghost tours, also for our history tours. So definitely if you are interested in a tour and you want to snap one of those up and then redeem it when we are back open again, that is awesome. Yeah, if, uh, if you are interested, uh, I think the easiest way to find the link to that is if you look in our Facebook news feed, it's, uh, I have that pinned to the top about uh, the latest of what we have going on. So um, mm -hmm. th there's a link in there that will take you to our website, to um, specifically the website that is set up to sell the, the e-gift cards. Yeah. So, but with that said, we, uh, we greatly appreciate you tuning in. We, uh, we're we're happy, to, uh, happy to be able to ch chat with you all. And I uh, hope you all take care, stay safe, uh, we'll stay healthy. Yep, we'll see you next week. We will see you next week. So Have a good night, guys. Have a good night.